Hi, my name is Gary England. Thanks for joining me. This course is about severe weather from the vantage point of my lifetime of dealing with severe thunderstorms, from the normal events to the absolutely terrifying, life-threatening episodes. The main focus will be significant tornadoes, ones that are a serious threat to life. So what is a tornado? Take a look at this. It's gonna cross the road right ahead of us. There it is, Gary. Right ahead of us. Oh, power flashes. Power flashes right there on the road. Oh, it's on the ground, Gary. It's 200 yards. It's 100 yards away from me. Okay, Gary, we are three miles straight north of Luther right now. The tornado is one half of a mile straight east of us, and it is getting bigger. It's crossing the road. Oh, power flashes. Power flashes in Corning. A tornado is defined as a violently rotating column of air that extends from the thunderstorm base to the ground. We're gonna, we're gonna need state troopers out here. We're gonna need EMTs. Now, as we go through this, please keep in mind that tornadoes occur in all states, not just Oklahoma, but all states. Take a look at these graphics here. The first one we see average annual number of tornadoes per state based on 2001 to 2010. Now you see Oklahoma has 54, some years it's 55, some years it's less, but on this particular graphic, it's 54 tornadoes per year. Kansas, 116. Texas, 142. But this doesn't really tell the entire picture. Let's take a look at the next graphic. Average annual tornadoes per 10,000 square miles per state. This is where it gets down to it. Who has more tornadoes per square mile than any place else in the country? Well, I see Oklahoma has about nine per 10,000 square miles, but you look at Kansas, 12, that's 12 per 10,000 square miles, and you get down to Florida, 10. So Oklahoma, not at the top with this. Obviously we have tornadoes, but other states have them too. Tornadoes per county, we'll take a look at this, and you see a concentration, surprisingly, in and around Denver and to the north, down around Houston, and down in Florida. Fascinating. Here at the University of Oklahoma, there is a history of moving rapidly forward and making great progress on predicting, detecting, and evaluating storms, and of course, storm safety. But first, I'll share with you a little bit of my background. I'm presently Vice President of Corporate Relations and Weather Development for Griffin Communications, the parent company of KWTV, where I spent 40 years as Chief Meteorologist. From those listening uh, on your car radios, being in a car in a tornado is a really bad idea and you got to find a place to go and it might even be in a ditch but you can find a building somewhere uh, if you're at home below ground is best and if you don't have a below ground like a cellar safe room uh, or such uh, get in the middle part of your house put as many walls between you and the tornado as possible uh, shatter resistant goggles helmet long sleeve shirt long pants heavy shoes and uh, unfortunately if you're trapped at home you'll just have to ride it out don't jump in your car and drive out into this storm because you may well become a fatality if this happens. This is already a deadly tornado. Prior to those 40 years, the U.S. Navy was home for me for three years. There I am as a sailor boy, and there's where I ended up, Midway Island, mile and a half long, half mile wide, 5,000 service people on it. I gotta tell you, it was a long year. I did aviation weather forecasting for the Navy and Marines. I then went to the University of Oklahoma, graduating with a Bachelor of Science degree in math and meteorology. And there's my mom and daddy. And let me tell you, they were happy to see me get a degree. Besides television, I've worked as a consulting meteorologist and oceanographer, which included being air quality and meteorology discipline manager for an environmental impact statement for the og &E power plant near Perry, Oklahoma. I've completed numerous climatological and oceanographic studies, including some unusual ones, we might say, in the Caspian Sea, the Adriatic Sea, and the North Sea Ecofisk oil complex, and one for a proposed offshore nuclear generating plant. My resume includes weather and ocean forecasting, climate reports, and oceanographic studies for locations around the world, including the United States, the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, the North Atlantic from the equator northward, the Bay of Campeche, that's the southern Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf of Tehuantepec, the Yucatan Peninsula, coastal Honduras, Aruba, Trinidad, north coast of Colombia, Lake Maracaibo, coastal areas of Brazil, coastal areas of Argentina, Tierra del Fuego, Gulf of St. Lawrence, the Beaufort Sea, which is the north coast of Alaska, at least part of it, and the Gulf of Alaska, Midway Island to the Aleutians, North Sea, United Kingdom, Caspian Sea, Adriatic Sea, Liberia coastal areas, South African coastal areas, Madagascar, Indonesia, Java Sea, Australia coastal, and New Zealand coastal, 
to name a few. And to keep busy, I work as an expert witness in lawsuits involving weather. To put it in Oklahoma language, my speak, I've about done it all. Tornadoes, floods, hail, wind, lightning, hurricanes, dust storms, ice storms, blizzard, drought, heat waves, storm surges, ocean currents, bottom pressure, anomalies, 100 year storm wind and wave, wave forces, and you know what, I've loved every minute of it. You know, when I first came on the scene here in Oklahoma City in 1972, the warnings were less than outstanding, I might say. So often when a warning came out, I could only warn Tom because it blew Fred's house away first. It wasn't the people, it was we just didn't have the equipment. The, the advances just weren't there yet. Now back in the day, this series of images represents the leading edge in television meteorology. Let's take a look. And there I am, way back in the day, those were drums. They had four sides and it would rotate there and large tornado watch you can see in a tornado warning for Oklahoma. And then here's what we used. That's a radar with no radar. So when it rained or snowed, you couldn't see anything. And it's only about six foot across. So it really wasn't ideal, but it was the best we had at the time. And the next slide will show you what we work with. And brother, it was not easy, but it was great fun, very exciting, and quite a learning experience and an education. Next, we'll take a look. This is what we call the big board. I made that map because we needed a close-up. Nowadays, you use a computer to move in closer. Well, with this, I took nine U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey maps, uh, cut them out, pasted them together, put them on that board, and put plexiglass over them. And we had every town, every city, every highway on there. It was really quite fascinating. The next map will give you some idea. That's how we issued the warnings. We'd talk about the general area where the storm was, where I thought it would go, then I could mention the towns, and for the day, it was pretty advanced, just to tell you the truth. And then, let's take a look at the next one there. Actually, I had a company that manufactured these maps, and uh, they were quite nice, and all the towns and cities and highways were embedded in the plastic on the back side, so the meteorologist could uh, look at it and, and see it when the audience couldn't, so you, you appear highly intelligent when you use that. And then along came computers. Look at that. We thought that was really, really, really pretty. It's an ugly rascal, isn't it? But it was, it was an advance. And we issue warnings now a little bit different than what you just saw with the next image. And that's what we call the weather pod. And uh, all kinds of computers, you name it, everybody has it nowadays. And by the way, that's another uh, meteorology um, graduate right there with me. That's Mike Armstrong. And let's take a look here at the next shot. And you know, we've ex we expanded from a room that was probably about 10 square feet to an entire studio and a lot of people. And there's another uh, OU graduate uh, right there on my right. And I was issuing instructions during a tornado outbreak. That's Lacey. And we take a look at the next one. You can see it's just not the, those of us on the air. There's all kinds of people uh, scattered throughout the studio, uh, outside in the field. And the person there on your right is another meteorology graduate uh, here at OU, and that's Matt. What were we looking at that day? We were looking at this presentation. This is a radar presentation that shows precipitation, and there's a hook echo, and a major tornado in the Moore area. And that white ball right there at the bottom of the hook, that's a, what we call a debris cloud. Those are houses and buildings and cars in the air at that particular point. And we've seen these for years, but with the refinement of radars, better radars, we're able to see it more clearly now. So what happens? Big tornado in the Moore area. We're issuing warnings, everybody's working. We're seeing it live via the helicopter. So, you know, it's really quite fascinating to be in the weather office and you have all the electronic equipment, you have the satellite uh, items coming in, the images coming in, all the radio traffic coming in from the field. You have live video coming in the field and we're issuing warnings. So the, the input of information is almost overwhelming. And the next shot will show, and I want you to look at the look on our faces. It is not fun to deal with severe weather. It is not a game to deal with severe weather because people die. Gary, there's houses in the air here. Through the years, we made some worthy advances uh, to television and severe weather. I had been following the research at the National Sphere Storms Lab early on back in the day, and it was obvious Doppler radar was the future. You know, I talked the News 9 owner into purchasing the world's first commercial Doppler. It hadn't even been built yet. The people I called to build it I never thought about it, so it was a long process. But on May 15th, 1982, long time ago, a first for us, and we were happy about that, I was able to issue the first ever Doppler tornado warning to the public. And there I am, back in 82, and I have to tell you, the Doppler radars in those days looked like scrambled eggs. You had to try to interpret that. 
It was difficult. There were no computers hooked to the data. It just showed you the velocities, wind speed and direction, and the rest is up to you, brother. In 1990, we developed the first automated television warning system. The map in the corner of the screen and the weather crawls. This is a game show. We popped that map up the way those maps used to be done. Uh, we had a piece of red cardboard and an Oklahoma map with counties on it. And if, for example, the tornado warning was for Oklahoma County, we took a Zacto knife, cut out Oklahoma County, put it back on that red cardboard, put the camera on it, and it looked good. Well, this was actually coming from a computer. So we were pleased to be able to do that. In 1991, we developed the first storm projection system. It predicted the time of arrival and displayed it on the screen. It's that oval, it looks like a racetrack down the lower right hand screen there. And you, that, it would draw that, we'd, we'd plug into the computer program, which by the way, we had a fellow from OU write the program for us. And we'd plug in the, where the storm was, what direction moving the speed, and then that little oval, all the towns would populate that little oval. And up to the upper left was the time of arrival. The first time we ever used it was this day. On this same day, it projected that a tornado would hit near Ada at 433, and it hit near Ada at 433, and that takes a little bit of luck, but uh, that went on to be big time around the world and has improved dramatically on the time of arrival. In 1992, we experimented and used cellular phones for the transmission of tornado images and video. We all know where it's gone now. We see all the video coming into the field. Well, it started many years ago, and it really started at, at News 9. Through those early years, the University of Oklahoma, the Severe Storms Lab, and the National Weather Service constantly moved ahead. They forged ahead, developing new technology and new systems. The modification and testing of a large military radar designed to pick up aircraft and missiles was an astoundingly successful accomplishment that launched meteorology directly into the age of Doppler weather radar. And it wasn't easy and it took a lot of time. When you look at this graphic, let me tell you, there it is. Suddenly we're seeing the wind for the first time. Absolutely amazing. Creativity and dreaming big became the baseline for research and rapid development. And today with the National Weather Center, a consortium of federal and state organizations, along with the University of Oklahoma School of Meteorology, really, the sky is the limit. It's, it's unbelievable. Now, for example, models provide near real-time data on where tornadoes may occur. Kind of a tornado forecast, which something we never expected just a short time ago, but the movement is quick. The new radar research facility is already developing advanced radar systems, and the list goes on and on and on. What an exciting time at such an exciting place. In my opinion, the National Weather Center and the University of Oklahoma School of Meteorology are home to the brightest and best in the field of meteorology, radar, atmospheric modeling, and numerous other associated fields.